when you're writing fiction, you want it to be as, as realistic as it can possibly be. And, and even the, the, my grown up novels, which people who didn't live in Florida for years thought it was just some sort of, you know, just crazy, you know, made up stuff. And even now, Florida finally has achieved the reputation where people know that the novels are more documentary than fiction. That the, the sickest thing in every novel, if someone brings that scene up, I'll say, well, you know where that came from? That really happened. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son Troy each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Carl Hyacin, it's such an honor to have you on the podcast with us. When I was preparing for this, I wanted to read a couple of your columns. I had read your adult fiction, Hilarious, and your kids' fiction, Funny, Inspiring, and Award-Winning, no less than the Newbery Honor Medal. Well, I started reading the columns and I couldn't stop. My favorite had to be God is a Gunslinger and a close second, DeSantis's Race to the Bottom. I read all they have online, but I couldn't stop there, so I instantly bought both your books, Kick-Ass and Paradise Screwed. That's very brave. <laughs> I haven't even read some of those columns in years. Uh, years. I, I, miss, I miss writing it, but um, uh, I was, you know, the, it was a certain time and place for... Miami was the, the best source material for that stuff in, in the whole country. You were a reporter on the city desk. Could you explain what that entails? Well, I, I had gone to work there. Uh, it, uh, I was, it was the second newspaper I'd, I'd worked at, and they put everybody on the city desk. And in my case, it was Brow the Broward County Bureau, and I was born and raised in Broward County. So it was very much like going home and um, the... the uh, I stayed there for, I mean, at the city desk, you know, you go in every day and there's a new assignment. The one thing about the newspaper business is it's never the same day twice. There's no groundhog day. You go in and one day you're, you might be covering a zoning board meeting and next day you might be, uh, it might be a, a homicide or it might be a, a plane accident. So it, ke it kept you sharp in that way. And, and the other thing that helped tremendously in fiction, when in writing novels um, or and well, columns too, you get so used to writing on deadline that um, writer's block becomes a thing of the past. You don't have the luxury of writer's block because editors are don't tend to be terribly sensitive people. Uh, <laughs> you, if you you either have a story and you're turning it in, or you you're in trouble. So that discipline, I think, helped a great deal uh, with the fiction writing, and I also think. Just being out, listening to how people talk, looking how the, the real world operates, you learn so much that you can absorb, and not all of it, very little of it gets actually into the newspaper. But if you're writing sort of real time fiction or, you know, current fiction, it's, it's very helpful. I, I like those days quite a bit. But from there, I, I, um, they moved me downtown to Miami, which was even better. I got, they put me in a desk next to Gene Miller, who'd won two Pulitzer Prizes, one of the best reporters ever, which is like for me going back to journalism school. And, um, uh, from there, you know, Miami at that time was exploding. Sometimes literally it was just the best news town in the country. And, and for me to be there then and, and be able to, uh, uh, to be a part of writing about it, I think, uh, certainly, informs the, the fiction I do to this, to this day. Carl, you talk about hate mail from time to time, and I was wondering if you have ever received a piece of hate mail that was so funny that you said, touche. Yeah, I, I, this is going to sound immodest or arrogant or something, but 
uh, most of, of the hate mail or the angry letters I got um, were, how should I put this, borderline literate. Um, and, I mean, they were so angry that, you know, I got mail. It was scrawled in crayon one time. The, 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 the dude was so angry. And, and I understand those passions and things, but I, I don't have one in particular that rings out as something like, Oh, that's a good point. And they, they caught me. Usually there, there's just, they're, they're drooling with anger when they write it. And it just shows on the page. Now, you know, now everything's email, but for, for years I did try to open and look at all my, all my mail. And, um, and even at the Herald, I, you know, I, I couldn't keep up with the email, but if someone took the trouble of writing to me, I would, o- I would always write back to him. I had, you know, some sort of stock answers and cards and it would simply, usually it would just be, um, uh, sorry, we disagree. Um, please thanks. Thank you for taking the time to write. It was that simple, but if it was really something awful and uh, by that, I mean, uh, you know, racist or hateful or violent, you know, something that crossed the line into into more than criticism, not directed at me, but just in general, um, you know, uh, I would sometimes write back and I would say if they were silly enough to put their return address on it, I would write back on my stationery. I would say, dear Mr. So-and-so, I, I, I regret to inform you that um, someone with severe psychological issues is using your name and writing to our newspaper and I'm enclosing the letter so you can take proper action uh, with the authorities. And I would just send it back. Like that. <laughs> that was usually the end of it, you know. While he's working on that, Carl, is there anything that you wrote in particular that got like the most uh, hate mail or most uh, upset reaction or was it pretty balanced? <laughs> it was pretty balanced. I mean, you know, when uh, it, for the column, you know, I, I did the column for, Oh God, I don't know how 30, 60 years, 37 years or something. So during that period of time, you know, there was, there was so many, <laughs> I pissed off so many people that it just, uh, it just became a, a blur. But I have to say that, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I would say nine out of the 10 letters or responses I would get would be very, very positive. And, and it would be the reaction that you hope for as a columnist, which is that somebody felt like their voice was being heard, that their point of view was getting out there. And you're trying Mm -hmm. to strike that note of of commonality, or at least getting as many people who feel as frustrated, in the case of Miami, by the corruption, um, by the environmental destruction, all that stuff. There's so many good people that felt that way, and they reacted very positively to the column. So to me, that always overshadowed, overshadowed, um, you know, the, the, the people, you know, and it's like, and I'm, I'm sure, Tim, you've you've had it with your kids books. Every once in a while, you'll get a, li- a letter from um, I, I remember I got a letter from a librarian in Waco, Texas, when when Hoot first came out, the first kids book I did. And she said she was banning it from the school uh, because of obscenity. And I, I mean, I wrote the book. I couldn't. I wrote it for kids. I mean, my head, you know, uh, a stepson and, and nieces and nephews all that age. And I, I didn't remember putting any profanity in there. So I was curious about it. And I looked and she wrote on her objection was to the word, but B U T T a kid referred to another kid's, but, and to her, that was profane. And to, to confirm her suspicions, she had taken it to the cafeteria workers at the school, not, not the students or none of the teachers, the cafeteria workers that are working a late shift. And they all agreed that, but, the word but shouldn't be in a kid's book. And I did, I did kind of, I think had a snarky letter back on that one. I don't remember what it was, but um, in any case, I was just, you know, it was just astounding of everything. That's the thing that, <laughs> that was, that was the bad language in the book. And I know, I mean, I'm pretty sure they use that word in Mako, Texas commonly. <laughs> maybe even a worse one. Yeah, maybe worse. <laughs> I always tried to be family friendly too, but I actually had one of my kids' books get banned in North Carolina for the word crap. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know, it, at some level, and I don't know, Tim, you might not agree. At some level, I used to 
I used to kind of be proud when that happened, especially if, uh, you know, if it, I mean, I just always thought it wouldn't hurt book sales to get banned every now and then. I mean, my, my friend Judy Bloom has made a, I mean, she's thrived on it and just really, you know, kicked butt. And, uh, now it's not so funny in Florida because, um, there, it's, it's more of a, uh, a, a glorified purge. And, um, you know, it was a county in the panhandle that banned 6,000 books, including dic- dictionary and the thesaurus. I mean, I mean, pull them from the shelves for review. And what that means is some, some, some poor bastard's got to sit there and pretend that he's reading the Merriam-Webster dictionary from first to last to make sure there's no profanity in it. I mean, it's the absurdity is is uh, beyond anything you could create in satire. But in the, the old days, it used to be really kind of a badge of honor. I thought. I mean, North Carolina, the last book tour I was on, I had an event canceled there um, uh, for the kids' book. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure why, but there was an element in that book, a, a historical backstory set in Key West of a, of a, of a man that was hung by the, the uh, Ku Klux Klan on, on Christmas Day in 1921 in Key West. It really happened. And so his reference to that in the novel and it affected a generation, a couple of generations later, that story came back to affect the character. And that was the only thing I, I could see. Uh, that they they didn't specify, but they you know they canceled the the event. So I, I was just guessing that that was that might have I don't know, annoyed annoyed you know clan members. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's they have to be more lenient on that kind of stuff now, don't you think? With how society's gone since even in the last ten years, or no? Do you think it's still Not, that strict? Well, in, in Florida, it's gone the other direction. We have a governor that. You know, um, DEI and all that and all that stuff, and had taken you know people like uh, Tony Morrison and Alice Munro's books out of schools. I mean, uh, it it's gone the other way with this Moms of Liberty. Uh, you know, uh, their uh, kind of phony crusade um, to to purify the libraries and the schools. A um, couple of t- Tim's books run. Uh, a, one of the lists in Florida, um, uh, the, and they don't want to use the word banned. They just get pulled off the shelves until uh, somebody with enough time on their hands gets to review it, and then they might or might not be put back. But it's much more widespread now. It's become it was a battle cry of Ron DeSantis, you know, when he was when he was doing it, and then when he ran for president, and everybody. Nobody it didn't resonate. The message didn't resonate at all nationally, but he's still keeping it alive here. It, you know, it, it's it's upsetting. And I I feel uh, bad for the school board members. You get targeted because they're not out there, you know, as part of this Moms for Liberty crusade. Do you think there's a. I'm trying to think how to say this. Do you think there's a, a less extreme version? Like, do you agree with the, I guess the, the what everyone's scared of with the whole book banning thing is, I, I believe, like things that are over-sexualized in, in a school library. Do you agree with that point of it? Or do you have the school of thought that kind of just anything goes? I, 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 I come from the point of view that it should be always a parent's decision. I don't have any problem with that. And I certainly, when my kids were in school would have wanted to know if something was being taught in a classroom uh, that was over-sexualized. Now, I try to make the distinction between books that are available to check out and books that are being uh, taught as part of a a reading course or an English course. And I think if it's a a classroom textbook that every, a classroom book that everybody's got to read, I I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I think any parent is going to say, I don't particularly want, or I, I don't mind, I don't want, but I do think it, it should be up to the parents, not up to uh, political appointees, or um, in this case, the, the, the appointees to, uh, to to boards that the Senate has filled with, with his folks uh, who just want to 
take a hatchet to all of it. Yeah, there's some books. I mean, God, that when I was when I was a kid, and I'm sure when Tim was a kid, I mean, our, our school library was so small. I mean, you could have it was, you could find the Hardy Boys. You might could find Nancy Drew or uh, you know biographies of, of, of Willie Mays or, or uh, Roger Maris, but there there, there were not nearly the amount of uh, literature and fiction available to, to uh, young adults or to, or to middle grade readers. It just was unheard of. So yeah, I'm, there are probably undoubtedly things that uh, are troublesome and, and, and worrisome. I don't have a problem with that, but I, what I have a problem with is uh, shutting the parents out of the process. And because it, it, in the end it is a, it is up to, I think, the parent and the, and, the, and the child to discuss it. And the parent should be able to make that decision with the kid. But just to have the idea of, of somebody appointed by Ron DeSantis deciding what your kid reads is, is, uh, is pretty mortifying. Yeah, I, I, agree. I agree with the distinction between if it's being taught versus being available. I'm, I'm a young parent, so I don't have, I don't have that much experience, but I am, it does make me nervous that if there was stuff that was that, um, graphic. And the funny thing about it is I'm not, I wouldn't care if it was, you know, straight or gay or anything in between. Anything that was like overly sexual would make me nervous to have a, a young, I, I, my kids read. I absolutely agree. It's not a, in my mind, it's not a, uh, a, a gender specific issue at all. It's just, is it appropriate yeah. or is it not appropriate? Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I, some of the books that have been brought to the attention of, you know, and, and been held up are, are definitely something I wouldn't have wanted uh, a second or third or fourth grader to read. Um, but in the same swipe, those folks are still going after uh, to kill a mockingbird, uh, catcher right. in the eye. I mean, that's, they hold that up and then with their other arms sweep all the others into the same pile and, um, and, or the color purple, for example. I mean, and, and, um, th that, that is a tactic they use, but, but they'll, they'll pull out the most graphic and egregious and it, it would, I mean, it'll shock anybody. It would, sh you know, it would, I think, uh, shake up adults if they were pulling it off shelf for the first time, some of them. So, I, uh, yeah, I mean, it is, it's a tricky thing, but it's a slope that I don't think we want to start sliding the other way on right now in, 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 the, in the current climate of, the, of this country. Yeah, it seems like with everything nowadays, it's like the extreme and then it goes too far. It's like, the, it's like there's 10% on one and 10% on the other. Sure. And really the 80% in the middle, like it's pretty common sense. If it's not, I, I guess it's hard where to draw the line, but if there's something that's, if it's not overly sexualized, then let's leave it in there. Like to kill a mockingbird. I don't know why that would be. Um, anyways, we can, we can move on. <laughs> I'll have to go look at which ones my dads were under review. That's, that's funny. Yeah, I had, I had a list, uh, but you, you can see my desk is, uh, I, I would, you know, I, it's, it's, it's a mess. Carl, I want to ask about your life growing up. I read that you grew up on the edge of the Everglades in Florida, and it sounds like you gave Huck Finn a run for his money. I also heard that you collected snakes. What did your mother think of that? My guess is that she wasn't a fan. Well, mom, yeah, I mean, getting back, yeah, when, when I grew up, they, when there were no malls or anything. I mean, we, we got home from school, we'd get on our bikes, and you just all it took was you rode half a mile west, and you were really on the edge of the Everglades. Now, before our eyes, it was being developed and paved over, but you could ride a little farther. And I, there was really not much else to do. My friends and I collected snakes and critters and everything, and so I'd always had – Snakes. My mom was terrified of snakes. And I, I think my, I was drawn to them because of that. I remember one time I was about, this was standard when we were growing up in plantation. If your mother saw a snake, didn't matter what kind of snake it was, she called Hank. Hank was the police chief and the only officer on the plantation police, but it's the only one. He had a 56 Ford. 
I'll never forget. And you just call Hank and can't Hank came. And he'd shoot, he'd shoot the snake in your yard. He'd put it in his trunk and leave. That was just the protocol for growing <laughs> up, right? But I remember one time there was a beautiful snake in the backyard. It was a yellow rat snake, which is a gorgeous snake. It was it was climbing on a, on a bush, and my mom freaked out, and I and and I wanted to go catch it. And she was on the phone trying to get Hank. He's probably killing a snake somewhere else. But anyway, the snake got away. But I had friends that were interested, so I started catching them and collecting them. And, my mom was terrified and, and the little ones, I had a little terrarium set up in my bedroom. And you think, well, it, it, snake can't get out. It's glass. It's got a top on it. It would always get out. And, and I would never be able to tell her because she would have, she would have sold the house if she knew <laughs> there, was, there were snakes in the bedroom. But, um, to the, to, to the day she passed away, she just would shake her head. And just talk about those, like she would have, you know, how moms have this attitude in the voice. It's like this, where did I go wrong? Was in, that was her tone of voice whenever she talked to us. Where did I go wrong with him? But I still catch him here. We, we, we have some in the yard. I've caught, I've caught a few here in the yard and, uh, and, uh, trying to get my wife. She'll, she'll actually, if I catch him, she'll hold him, but she won't. She won't, you know, go for them. Just make the grab, you know, but I'm working on that. <laughs> Did you actually begin writing in the first grade or is that urban legend? Well, yeah, I, 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 my dad, my dad got me a typewriter when I was six. So I would have been at that point in second grade. But I've been writing by hand little stories and I kept journals, you know, in those days, I don't know, you call them diaries or whatever, but I, I wrote a lot of stuff down. And, and so, but my handwriting, even as, as then was terrible. I couldn't read it the day after I wrote it. this, this went right into my newspaper years because you, in those days we had reporters notebooks, you know, you stick them in your back pocket and you take quotes. And I'd have to go, I was the only one that went back to the newsroom and have to type up everything I just wrote in order so I, I wouldn't forget it, it, it for the story. And so um, so my dad got me this uh, little manual typewriter. And um, and yeah, so I, I would have been around six. And uh, I used to do little sports stories and things in the neighborhood. You know, we had like a kickball league or a tetherball, you know, stuff. So I wasn't very big. I mean, I didn't I, I played baseball for a couple of years, but I didn't I never played football or anything. And I wasn't uh, tall enough because uh, um, I I skipped a grade. So I was a year younger than all my friends. And so but in those in year, if you're playing basketball, <laughs> can be like four or five inches of height. So there was no I didn't really have a chance playing basketball, but I did do little stories and I enjoyed doing that. And um, I, I remember I had a big spiral notebook and, and for a while we had to take a bus. Our high school in middle school called junior high in high school and was being under construction. So we were at every day go from West Broward to the Naval Barracks at the Fort Lauderdale airport, the old Naval Barracks where the um, World War II, they had a lot of planes there. And, and the barracks were on air conditioning on there. It, it was just awful, but there was a long bus ride every day. So I would ride on the bus every day. I'd be, I'd just sit there, you know, writing stories, whatever, uh, ch chapters of, of little novels and things, but that was by hand. Um, so as far back as I, I'm lucky because as far back as I can remember, it was something I always enjoyed doing. I, I, I never was sure I could obviously make a living at it, but I, I, so I aimed at, working in the newspaper business because that interest in journalism was very interesting to me. And I figured I'd get to write every single day and that's the were best you, way to get better. Were you drawn to it naturally or did your typewriter gift kind of bring you towards, no, I guess, or did you have a family influence or it's very no, unique to have a six year old writing store stories and writing recaps of the, the lo local uh, recess or local kickball game. No, I, I wasn't in any way a normal kid i don't think but but my mom had been an english teacher my dad was an attorney and he worked every re weekend at home and he would in those days type his his own briefs and everything so i was used to having saturday off and seeing my dad sitting at a, a little table in the family room he had he had a little uh, i never i was one of the first little smith coronas an electric he got an electric typewriter which i think he deserved probably but he'd sit there 
and and uh, and he'd be typing these long legal briefs that were going to be filed. But I all I, I just remember him sitting there, you know, banging away. And of course, he's got the Marlboro hanging out of his mouth and a you know Pabst Blue Ribbon next to him, but <laughs> was still working his ass off, you know. And so I'm sure that it, it, I imprinted on that in some way. Um, uh, and and I, I, I was lucky to grow up in a house where reading was very much encouraged, you know, and, um, uh, and of course, at a time when you didn't have the internet and 780 television stations uh, uh, to distract a kid that age, there was literally not, I mean, there wasn't a lot to do, um, you know, if you weren't, if you weren't into fishing and snakes and being outside all the time, I mean, there, there weren't the distractions and, and, I got, you know, I, I just always tell people how lucky I feel that I, I think I knew pretty early on what I wanted to do. And, um, and it's almost in a freakish way, uh, cause no, nobody should <laughs> know at age six what they want to do. I mean, that's disturbing. I mean, <laughs> from, you know, it's not normal. What was high school like for you? What interests did you have? Were you a voracious reader? If so, any favorite authors? Well, in high school, I mean, I was I was a good student. Um, we'd always have, you know, one like uh, English creative writing class or an English literature class for something. But I did a lot of outside reading. But I was I was very much into sports, and uh, I mean, as a fan. And so I remember now, you know, I I burned through all the Hardy Boys novels, and I was I would read I would read some f- fiction, and I, I mean even. My mom didn't want me. To, <laughs> my mom, she, she, she thought, I, she thought Ian Fleming was a bad influence on the youth of America for James Bond. So I'd, of course, smuggled the, the James Bond books. I'd read those, you know. Um, but I read a lot of sports biographies. I, I, I mean, I, I really did. I mean, uh, especially baseball players, uh, uh, of that generation. When I was a kid, the New York Yankees had spring training in Fort Lauderdale. So my grandfather would take me to see, you know, the, those great teams play. It was uh, spring training was much different than it was. A, it was like almost like a high school ballpark. It was nothing like it is now. And you could walk right up to the fence and, you know, watch them at batting practice, be, be from here to the wall away and ask for our, it was just a different kind of cool thing. But, you, but, but I remember uh, sort of gobbling up. You know the the sports biographers that they write of the play Roberto Clemente or or you know Willie Mays or McCubby or all. I mean, I read all of those. Um, I, uh, I I also I did a, a news a newsletter in high school. I, I, I never I never got in sync with the administration of the high school. It was, um, you know, it, it was the late sixties and uh, we. But anyway, so I, I started this underground newsletter. Now I say underground. It, it wasn't really authorized, but they let me use a mimeograph machine. Do you remember what those were like? You put the inked paper, you type what you're going to, you actually write it on a, a piece of special carbon paper. And then it goes through this machine and you, as many times as it goes, it makes copies, uh, printed copies along like legal size and you, and you hand it out by hand. So my my newsletter was called More Trash. And whenever the high school paper came out, which was all about, you know, uh, pep rallies, you know, and and I I I cast a somewhat darker vision of high school in the newsletter. And it was it was meant to be satirical and funny, you know, at the same time sharp. But but I remember uh I couldn't believe they let me get away with it, but I remember getting stopped in the halls by like football players, big jocks. And I thought, Oh man, you know, I had enough trouble getting pushed around in high school because of my size. I thought this is not going to be, but I remember a bunch of them saying that was funny. We really liked that dude. And it, and it struck me that that might be a way to navigate through life. Uh, if, if you weren't, you know, uh, a, a, a brute or a particular kind of fighter, that if you made people laugh, if you can make people laugh, read something and make them laugh and make them laugh for the right reasons, if you know what I mean. It just was a cool feeling. 
So it became a, a popular thing in the school. Um, whenever, you know, when I would go back and crank these things out on the mimeograph, <laughs> it was a pain in the ass. And I'll tell you why, because you can't make, you couldn't make a mistake on it because, you know, it's type, you, the, the key to the typewriter would be hitting uh, ink, ink paste. So if you made a mistake, you had to back up and type over it like 50 times real hard. If, if you meant to put an S there and there's an F there, bam, 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 bam. So it, it would come out looking okay. It was a, it was a real, I think by real pain, but it was fun. And, um, and I enjoyed it. Then when, when I went off to college, I, I wrote, um, uh, columns for the school newspaper, both at, at Emory and, and the University of Florida, satirical columns, hopefully funny columns. I, 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 I'd be terrified to look at them today, but you know, at the time I thought they were brilliant. I was a fanatic reader of the Hardy Boys series growing up. They were my favorite. Isn't isn't that funny? You know, I don't know. You probably already know this story, but for years, this is I was telling you a story on myself. You know, the author of the Hardy Boys was Franklin W. Dixon, who was on every one of the books. And, and I had started reading them before they even finished the series. You know? And I thought, what a, what a cool dude this must be. What a, what a cool guy Franklin W. Dixon must be. So years later, of course, I find out there's no Franklin W. Dixon. It's this guy in Canada whose name I'm ashamed to say I can't remember now. He was a novelist and a writer who was struggling. You know, he lived in Canada and he, he got offered this gig by the publisher. Hey, we need, we need a boy's sort of adventure detective series. And he started writing them on the side and made up the name Franklin W. Dixon. And they took off, they exploded, of course. And the deal he had signed was for some, you know, some brutally small amount of money. And these things were <laughs> selling through the roof. And he, I, I, he, he passed away a few years ago. And I, I don't know where I saw it in the New York Times or somewhere. It was a bitch where, you know, Hardy Boys guy. There was the guy. And to try as he might, he was never known for anything except being the ghostwriter behind the name Franklin W. Dick. <laughs> I just I'm, looked it up. It's Leslie McFarlane. Yeah, it's a great, it's a Canadian name. Perfect. But the guy, I mean, just think about the millions of, of kids, Tim, like you and me and, and, and generations since that read, read Hardy Boys. And the guy, to him, he's like back in a room going, oh, I got to do another one of these things. You know, and he's he's got his own novel going, this is what's paying the rent. And it, it wasn't paying a lot. I mean, it, it, I hope I hope his at least his family's getting royalties somewhere in, in the in the publishing heaven world. Where do you think you got your sarcasm from in your writing? Did your wit come naturally to you or did you have to sit down and think about it? Ah. <sighs> That's a that's a good question. I mean, in in the house I grew up in, uh, around my mom and dad, sarcasm wasn't a good thing. Uh, it, it was not encouraged. It was uh, yeah, be civil, be nice to your brothers and sisters, you know. And my instinct was always to be kind of a smartass, and I I was also kind of a smartass in school, and I found that to be a, kind of a defense mechanism for me. Uh, and, um, again, if I could say something in class that, that made people laugh, I, it would be, I'd be shocked, but going, Hey, that was a good feeling. They, they laughed at something I said. And then if it was something I wrote in that newsletter, I love, I liked it even better. But, you know, I, I, I don't know where it came, but I've talked to Dave Barry a, a lot. He's a good friend of mine and, and, and not analyzing humor because, you know, it, when you see somebody like him and it seems to be so natural and he's as funny in person as he is on paper. But what we talk about, at least when you're putting it on paper, how uh, arduous it is, because I, mean, I wrote a couple novels early on with another reporter that were strictly kind of, uh, you know, mysteries based on whatever stories we were working on at the time. And they, they were, we wrote together, it was a collaboration it's a whole different process um, if you're writing a book that people are expecting to be sharp and satirical and funny because every line is just uh, every funny line is one one bad adjective away from not working. Uh, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a thin, thin 
a line between something that's funny and that works and that's just the tone you want and something that just falls flat. And, and, and I, I, I end up, I mean, I always thought it was hard work. The columns were hard work too. Even, even when the material was, was so great, I still agonized. I still woke up in the middle of the night agonizing about a comma or, uh, you know, or a, a transition. And I do that to this day when I'm writing. I still, is that, is that going to mess up the flow? Is that, you know, I still beat myself up with that stuff. Um, I mean, but my attitude is never, I mean, my mom said I was a smart ass from the time she could remember. You know, I mean, she would, you know, you know and my dad, I, can, I remember being four or five years old and saying something at the dinner table, uh, a cutting remark or, or something to uh, one of my sisters or something. And, and uh, I remember my dad, he was, he was a quiet guy. He just looked over at me and said, your mouth is going to get you in trouble one day. <laughs> and he was, he was right. It did. <laughs> but um, so I think I would maybe, I don't know how I developed that. All I know is that when I went into journalism, you know, fairly young in college, I was already as cynical as uh, a, a reporter who'd been covering the police beat for 25 years. My view of humanity was already in that place. I wasn't, I was beyond getting shocked. I was beyond getting disappointed. I expected the worst. And, and, you know, and I don't, I don't know where that came from. Honestly, it just nothing. Uh, I mean, I just, I went in thinking, you, you know, we're all doomed and uh, I'm just writing about it. <laughs> I read that you transferred colleges. What made you transfer from Emory to the University of Florida? Well, <laughs> that's a that was a good story. I I went to Emory. My, my dad had gone there, and and my girlfriend at the time, uh, high school girlfriend, uh, uh, was going to FSU in Tallahassee, and I'd been um, accepted at Duke, but I wanted to be closer to her. Uh, you know, in terms of visiting or her visiting me. So I chose, I chose Emory. It was a good school and they had an, a, an English department. Um, and, and so I, I was, I was going, I was going to be an English major. And then I, and then, uh, I ended up, uh, as events happened, getting married my freshman year to my high school girlfriend and then having a baby. And I mean, and I, and I was, 17 when I was a, a freshman at Emory. And, and I, then I, at that point, you kind of hit the accelerator and start thinking about jobs, even though you're that young. I, I, now I've got a family, right? So um, I, I knew I wanted to be in journalism. They didn't have a journalism school. And uh, Gainesville, University of Florida, had a terrific journalism school. So after two years at, at Emory, I mean, I could have stayed in the English, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to go into law, pre-law or any of that. I didn't want my, I, I, uh, you know, I didn't want to teach English, you know? Um, so I, I just wanted to write. So then that's when I transferred. Um, it was like the summer of, let's say summer of 72, maybe down to Gainesville. And, and I just, I went steadily, didn't take a break, just went until I got my degree. I, you know, I, I, you know, just to get my degree and get out in the world and start working. So, I mean, I was highly, highly motivated. Um, and I think that having that happen, it did happen to me, but I mean, ha having that course sort of laid out in front of me and, and, uh, you know, uh, it helped me focus. There was no, there was no party years for me. And I, I don't think I missed anything in college, honestly, I would just zero, I had to zero in pretty early on on uh, career choices and just keep writing to try to get better and better and better, you know. And then when I was at Emory, I met a, a great guy, uh, Dr. Neil Schulman, who was there and he was uh, just finishing up medical school and he had written piles and piles of manuscripts of a uh, funny stories about medical school and he wanted to turn that into a novel and, um, and somebody in the English department connected him with me. And so I ended up working with him on two, two books. Um, I, my name wasn't on them, but, but I, I got to understand that process of writing fiction. And one of those ended up getting to be 
uh, made it in, into a movie called, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember, it was called Doc Hollywood and, and Michael J. Fox was in it. Woody Harrelson was in it. And I remember going into theater to see it. And these were characters. Some of them, I had come up with the names and the, some of the plot line and seeing that happen, you, you know, it's, it was a big confidence builder for some, somebody who's young. And, you know, I mean, not that you wanted to write from it, it was just the idea that you could come up with a story, uh, and, and a narrative drive and, and, um, the structure, um, it gave me hope that maybe I could, I could do that on the side, you know, write novels on the side while I was working at the newspaper and, and make a little extra money. You wrote for both the college papers at Emory in Florida. Is there one or a couple of college professors who you learned the most from? Anyone that you still hear in the back of your mind when you're writing today? I very much, there were, there were two, two at Gainesville. Um, uh, when I first, this is funny in itself. When I first transferred, uh, to the University of Florida, I, I, I signed up in the broadcasting curriculum because I thought the future of journalism was going to be in TV, other media. Um, uh, and I thought, well, you reach more people. And I also thought it was a way if, I, if I did, get a leg up and be able to start writing some humor and some satire television seemed like, you know, uh, uh, more of a bright future. Now my first semester in Gainesville, a, a great journalism one oh one. my professor was Gene chance and it was required whether you're in broadcasting or not, you had to take JM one Oh one. And, um, after about two weeks, she said, why are you in the broadcasting curriculum? And she said, you belong in hard news. You belong working for newspapers. This was partly because that was her back. And it was partly because I was a terrible broadcast. <laughs> I didn't have the voice for it. I'm down in uh, the, uh, trying to splice tape and do radio. That was horrible. And But beyond that, she said, you can do really well in newspapers. I think you should switch to the to the news, ma- news major. And I, and I did. And it was the best thing ever. But I also remember her first day of class. And uh, she said, right away, I'm going to tell you, all you people are here. You're all freshmen. You all want to be newspapers. Some of them wanted to be advertising. Some of them wanted to be in sport, whatever. And they said, here's what's going to happen. It's all about factuality. If you get, when you turn in your stories to me, and when you turn in your papers to me, if there's one error, if you get the middle initial of somebody wrong, just the middle initial. If there's one error in the whole piece, F, you fail. All of a sudden, holy shit, you know. And But I was member of Drilled Into Me, and I remember the first time we turned in papers, you know, I'm and three or four kids, I mean, like, like got the, they misspelled the mayor of Gainesville's name or something. It was just the hammer came down. It's a big fat F. These are kids never got an F before in their life. They're shattered. They're turning to puddles in the classroom. And I'm thinking, okay, but that's the standard. That's what they held you to. You know, if you didn't see it, you don't write everything down. I mean, double check everything. And that's the way, that's why that, that was and is such a good journalism school. But for, you know, but very few people come into series where you make one mistake, it's an F on your paper. I mean, that's pretty harsh, but it, her point was, well made. You want to be in this business. You, you, you can't tolerate any mistakes. And of course they, they get made, but at the time I'll never forget Gene. And we also had an editorial writer who won a Pulitzer Prize for, um, writing, uh, editorial about the civil rights issues in the early sixties. And, uh, his name was Buddy Davis. It was the same deal when editorial writing was like a year or two later. And I forget what it was a 300 level course or something, but Buddy'd sit there. And the whole thing was he'd, he'd write a subject for you to write an editorial on. That's research it. Everything has to be perfect or if no fact there, as Lena say, you turn it in. And this is how he graded you. Oh, you had to bring a, a, a little cassette tape the first day of class and you handed it to Buddy and he said, and you put your name on it and your grade, he, he gave you the, he didn't post the grade. He gave you the cassette back. You took it home and you played it. And it was like a five minute critique of your 400 word editorial. The last line was always the grade. 
I think you did a good job with this, but you really left a hole in your logic and you're just dying in your middle. So for that reason, that's a B minus. And you just go, oh, you know, that's how it tortures you. That's what he was famous for. But I'll tell you what, uh, by the end of the semester, you, you tightened up and you, you were doing it pretty well, or, you know, or that was the end of the, you weren't in journalism anymore. You were somewhere else in, in, in the school, but that was a gut wrenching, uh, thing. It was like, uh, it was like Shark Tank only <laughs> for kids getting, no, no, you're not. So I remember them very well. Right after graduating with your degree in journalism, you landed your first professional job in Cocoa, Florida. Were you grateful for the job or was any part of you disappointed because you knew that your talents merited more? Well, I was, I was, uh, I wasn't overconfident, but I understood that uh, in those days, papers like, you know, Miami Herald is one of the top 10 papers in the country at that time. The St. Petersburg Times, phenomenal newspaper, now Tampa Bay Time. And I put in my applications there and I even had the had the balls to send them some of the columns from the from the student newspapers, knowing that they're really not in the market for a 21 year old <laughs> columnist. But I did that. And I, of course, I got. I got rejected, and uh, I, but out of my whole graduating class, you know, in, in the journalism program and in, in news, there was only a handful of, of us that had the jobs waiting when, when we got out. And I had, I had gotten two offers, both for the exact same amount of money, $150 a week. It was, uh, one was in Cocoa, and one was at the Fort Lauderdale News in Sun Sentinel, which was my hometown paper, even though we got the Herald and, and, and it was an afternoon newspaper. And, but I was, this gets back to my feelings about what was happening to Broward County in my hometown. I had real misgivings about going back there because every time I went back on college, it would change so much and they were just paving over the whole place. And it, it was, it was getting so crowded. I just got so discouraged personally going back there. Uh, just, of, of just of the stampede of humanity that I, I decided to take the job in central Florida in Cocoa. And that was a, it was called Cocoa today it was named newspaper. And it was actually a, a template uh, uh, for USA today. It would be the, the same, the same guy, Al Newhart that was doing that uh, started USA today. And, and you know, and uh, so it was a good experience. I was there for about two and a half years and I got to do pretty much everything. They even had a, a, a Sunday magazine and, and I would later write it for the Herald Sunday magazine. So I got to do not only in addition to the, after I was on the de news desk for a while, they moved me to the feature section and I did some work for the magazine. I got to do a lot of cool, cool stuff when I was there. And I didn't mind being not in the, in a big city because, you know, my son, my youngest son at the time was just a, a little guy, you know, and, and, um, and we could do outdoors things. There wasn't the traffic, you know, I didn't mind being out of South Florida even then. I, and then, um, but then eventually the, the Herald offered me a job and, um, and, uh, my dad had, had passed away uh, suddenly. And, uh, and I, I, I went back there just to, to be closer to my mom. You know, uh, I, so I went back and, 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 and took a job at the Herald in the Brower Bureau and, and my, and, um, and lived not, and I rented a place not too far from my mom. Um, so that, th that and the fact that it was the Miami Herald, which was the big time, you know, th those two things, when, when the offer came, I, I said yes, you know, and obviously they paid a little bit better than the, the Gannett company did. So, um, and, and it, I mean, it was the, it was one of the best things I ever made, but I did agonize over it. I really had mixed feelings about going back there just because of the sentimental attachments to the place. And uh, but um, that's how that's how I but I, I don't resent a, a day I spent in Coca. I was just uh, Tim, I was just happy to have a job. So many of my friends at the school had not, you know, they were still waiting for someone to hire them. And at least I had work. In fact, my first, I didn't go to my graduation at Gainesville because they said that was my first day I was supposed to show up in the newsroom. 
So I was, I was, I had already put the U-Haul on and moved everybody down to Coco. And I was, I was in the, I was working in the newsroom on the, the day uh, that they had graduation in Gainesville. So, but, um, but, you know, years later when my, my son, all grown up, uh, graduated from the same school, he did the exact same thing. He bailed on his graduation. He was already working at a paper too. So he did the same thing I did. Do you remember what you did with your very first paycheck? <laughs> Um, I remember I, I took it uh, right to the bank and, uh, I, and I remember being so excited about it, uh, cause you know, f- finally, I mean, I was getting paid to do something I, I enjoyed. I had worked, you know, and during the summers, this, this, you know, I'd worked as a kid, as a, as a bank teller for a couple summers at a bank. I worked, you know, as a, a janitor at a a daycare center, which, and I, I also worked as a janitor at uh, two different veterinary, you know, veterinary offices. And I will take the veterinary office any day over a daycare center, by the way, if with a mop and a bucket, give me the dogs and the cats any day. Um, uh, Cause they don't even pretend to try to hit a toilet. They're just going, the kids were everywhere. So I'd done all that. So it was just, it was the first, uh, paycheck I, I think I'd ever gotten for for actually putting putting words on paper so that was exciting but I also you know I had bills I had you know uh, a family and uh, so it wasn't it wasn't playtime for me I mean it was just like okay just onward you know and and uh, but again and this is true today you, you feel, for a lot of kids you feel so lucky just to have work you know what I mean just felt like Okay, at least uh, at least I'm I'm in the system. You know, I, I if I can do this and get better and better, I'll I'll always have something to do. Of course, at that, at that point, I thought newspapers would would thrive forever, <laughs> and and that uh, you know, and they certainly I got I was I was there for the best of it. You know, I, I got to experience that 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 newsroom vibe when it was. Uh, because when I got out of school, remember that I got out of school and and uh, I went to work at Cocoa, and then about two months later, three months later, Richard Nixon resigned. So I was in journalism school during Watergate, the whole Watergate scandal unfolding. All of us wanted to be Woodward and Bernstein. I mean, what would be better, right? And and uh, and I remember one of my feature assignments, and this is so ironic. Looking back now and what we're going through, but, but, you know, if, the feature story, the rumor was going around, Richard Nixon was going to resign, resigns. So I, I was working on the city desk in Cocoa and they sent me to the Merritt Square shopping center. And this was back when they had stores that, you know, television stores where they put all of the TVs in the picture window and they all have them on, you know, the TVs would be on because they would do it for the space launches up there in Cocoa too. So, you go to the mall and everyone's standing around outside the plate glass window of the TV store. And they're all glued to it, you know, uh, waiting for Nixon to resign. And that's, that's where I was. I was interviewing people as they watched the president of the United States resign in scandal. And, um, so it, what I'm saying is that it was sort of the, the heyday, or we thought it was of investigative journalism and, and public service journalism. Um, it was never a job you went into to make any money. I mean, you knew going in that the pay was to use your word, Tim, crap. <laughs> we, we knew it was going to be crappy pay, but it was exciting as hell. Yeah, that's that's really good timing. What an exciting thing to come out of school writing. I guess to be learning in school and then come out writing about. Yeah. Then just after two years at your first job in Coco, you land what must have been your dream job, the Miami Herald. It, it was. I mean, as I said, I was a little ambivalent about it, but it was definitely the major leagues. I went. Um, uh, there was so much talent in that newsroom that it was uh, it was overwhelming, but also exciting because it was just, especially once I got down to Miami and I, I commuted every day. I never actually moved to Miami. I stayed in Broward and and, and got a place just uh, in plantation. And uh, not too far from my mom, but um, and and uh, 
So I was commuting every day. I can't imagine doing it now. It was it was a it was a pretty grueling back then, but now it would be impossible. And um, and then at night I'd start when I was at the Herald. I started working on books with another reporter, Bill Montalbano, who's a dear friend of mine, and he he got the idea that he wanted. You know, we, we were covering the the at that time was the cocaine wars, which were. A real thing long before Miami Vice was on the air. It was happening. And, um, and I, I've been writing about some characters. Some, um, I did a, I did a story, a, a big story about a, um, uh, a Colombian hitman, an assassin that had been sent to the United States to, uh, to work for one of the, well, we didn't call them cartels then, but that's what it was, a gang. And, and I'd written about him. And he'd been he'd been in and out of the Dade County Jail about five times. I just changed his name. They let him out, uh, he, and he was he had slipped through every web uh, there was, and he was out and loose then. And his his his, uh, his nickname was El Loco, and it was so it was so early on in the drug wars that by the time I left the Herald, if you went on their archive and looked up, if you typed in El Loco and co- cocaine. He he was like El Loco number one. There was about five that came after him, so he was like the first El Loco. And and Bill had said, you know, we 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 huge fit in the novel. We should do a novel about the cocaine wars, and and so we did that, and it got published. And we did two other books together, and and uh, and then uh, Bill Bill went off to uh, he he was one of the first uh, Western journalists to to get into Beijing and open the the a news bureau there. And it was just impractical to try to write, um, to try to collaborate at that point. And I think I also, both of us wanted to write our own kind of book because I still wanted to do satirical kind of novels. And uh, at the same time, I learned so much about publishing and, and uh, uh, my friendship with Bill ended up, uh, that's, we, we ended up with Esther Newberg as our agent um, uh I had sent a, a, Bill and I had written about five chapters and I sent it to Pete Hamill, who was a friend of mine. And I knew Pete had published books. And I said, who, what do we do with this? Are we trying to get it published? And, you know, and so he uh, suggested an agent named Lynn Nesbitt and Ed, uh, Esther was working for her as a, um, uh, she was an assistant. And, and of course, Lynn wasn't going to, she gave it to Esther to read it. And within a couple of weeks, Esther sold it. And, and that was, and I, I've been a client of hers ever since. That was, I don't want, I want to say like 1979. So, and and <laughs> I, I've been a client of hers ever since. But so all good things happened from those years at the Herald, and, and including I learned a lot from Bill, who was quite an elegant writer and uh, almost a lyrical kind of writer, which you didn't see often in the newspapers. And, and, uh, uh, storyteller kind of, and, and I just, you know, I was, well, I was fortunate in, in, in so many ways. And, um, and I think back on it a lot. I, I, I sometimes wonder if I, if it happened again, if I, if I could get public that way, you know, I don't know. I mean, if, if all that would, all those chips would fall the same way if I was just, you know, starting out right now, for example, were you worried writing about like people like El Loco and stuff like that? Were you ever worried about your safety? No, I had I had uh, real doubts that he had a library card. I, I didn't think that was <laughs> um, no. By the time I wrote about him, he was wanted by every agent. They eventually caught him in California, in Los Angeles, oh, okay. and um, but I, I was I didn't I didn't get any. I was wor- I was worried less about them than like. Uh, uh, condominium associations or something, you know, they were much more uh, volatile. Than, uh, <laughs> but, I, but I remember going out, riding out to LA with a uh, uh, Miami homicide detective to interview El Loco in the LA County jail. And uh, shockingly, he, he didn't want to sit down for an interview. <laughs> His heart wasn't in it. And so it was a long trip for nothing, but I had to give it a shot. I mean, you can't stand there. Can, can I see? I'd like to see El Loco. I'm here to see El Loco. His name was Conradio Valencia. I'm assuming he's no longer with us, but if he is, you know, bygones be bygones. <laughs> you were a reporter on the city desk. For all of us non reporters, can you explain what that entails? 
Well, it's just like I said on the city desk, it's just like um, you walk in every day and they, they hand you an assignment and it could be anything. And it could be a great assignment, fun, and or it could be dreadfully boring. But you learn to write all different kinds of ways and stories. I mean, your job is to make it obviously get all the facts, but also make it interesting because you're competing, at least in those days, on a, on a newspaper page with headlines and all different stories. And it was a well-known fact even then. Most people didn't read to the end of a story. So, you know, you're skimming. And I, I rarely do myself, actually, these days. Uh, but but you you wanted to write something interesting enough. And we always, we always said you, you want them to at least turn to the jump page. And the jump page was, you know, if you – if your story was on page at the bottom page B, front page B, the B page, local page, you know, get to the bottom and said continued on page, you know, three B. And if you could get them to turn and read the whole story, that that was something. And, and so the challenge was how do you make, you know, a hearing about local sewage rates, uh, you know, great literature? How do you make that so compelling that anyone wants to read past a paragraph? You know, but that was the fun. I mean, that was the challenge of it was you had to get it right. You couldn't be too, you couldn't push the limit too much. But, um, you know, it just, you learned, you learned, and you learned a lot about how things worked, how government worked, how, how, how politics did or didn't work. Um, you learned about lobbyists, you learned about influence peddling. And if you worked anywhere in South Florida, you learned how corruption worked. I mean, basic garden variety political corruption uh and, and it was it was prevalent then it's prevalent now but if you're then you're going to become a novelist that's that's a good that's a good thing to know what's going on when the when the zoning board suddenly um, <clears throat> excuse me suddenly has a recess nobody knows why and then they come back and one vote switched all of a sudden one guy's changed his mind you know uh and he, he may or not may or may not be going on an unexpected, uh, all expenses paid vacation to the Bahamas in a couple of weeks. But something happened, and and you w- once you learn that, and it almost always proves to be true. Uh, they they don't just change their mind out of the goodness of their souls. Their their, their thinking suddenly hasn't become clarified. Somebody got to them, and what what was the deal? So, you know that those are all important lessons and all useful. When you're when you're writing fiction, you want it to be as, as realistic as it can possibly be. And and even the, the, my grown up novels, which people who didn't live in Florida for years thought it was just some sort of, you know, just crazy, you know, made up stuff. And even now, Florida finally has achieved the reputation where people know that the novels are more documentary than fiction. That the, the sickest thing in every novel. If someone brings that scene up, I'll say, well, you know where that came from? That really happened. And then they're quiet after that. They just, their heads bow. They go, oh, my God. You know, I mean, it's you can't, as Dave always says, you can't make that stuff up. My dad used to always say when he was writing, the truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah, I mean, it, and in, in Florida, it's just... It, the, the trick is keeping, if you're writing satire, how do you stay ahead of, of the true life insanity? I mean, uh, how, how do you write something, make something up in a satirical way for, for a long storyline that, that isn't eventually going to come true in Florida? It's challenging because no matter what you think up, it'll happen eventually. <laughs> is truth really stranger than fiction? Even in a Carl Hyas sin novel, yeah, I think I think it is, and I think it, I think it's been playing out uh, nationally the last several years. I mean, if you could have if you could have invented um, uh, the cast of characters that we've just seen on the national stage from. Michael Cohen, the Stormy Daniels, to Donald Trump, to Don Jr., to the to to Rudy. What's happened to Rudy Giuliani? I mean, and and it, it just you if you cast those in a novel, 
the initial action of a novel about the presidency, the initial reaction of an editor 10 years ago would have been, yes, ridiculous. It could never, it's so ridiculous. You can't even write satire about it. Now you, you can't, it's so ridiculous that you can't uh, improve on it with satire. And, 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 and so I think, I think even more so truth is, is every day is, is stranger than fiction. And in fact, on some days it's hard to, you know, I, I grew up as a news junkie when you were in the business, you were, and now and maybe it's just because I've gotten older, maybe it's just more depressing, but there's, there's plenty of days where I don't, I purposely don't pay that much attention to the news because if I'm writing and I'm working, I know it's going to bring me down. And it's also, going to distract me, you, you know, you're trying to be funny, you know, I mean, uh, and some of the headlines, there's no, there's not even any way to make fun of them to be funny. It's, they're so grim and they're so, uh, you know, the, the weight of them is so heavy that you just, I, I have to kind of shy away some days just to try to get through a certain section of a novel or a scene or something just to, to not get completely bogged down and, and, uh, you know, in doom, uh, in a feeling of doom. I know you don't write biographies, but I am curious what you will say as a fellow author, which of your adult novels is the most biographical, if you had to say? Most biographical. That's a good question. I, I don't know. I mean, I think that, in, I think that if every novelist were honest, there's a, a piece of him or her in every book in some character. There's one character in every book that echoes more more closely, you know, than than, than others do. I mean, I don't think even even the bad guys in the novels. I think you have to you have to take responsibility for those that you know, that came out of your brain, as disturbing as they might be. I think probably the most autobiographical, and it's an ironic way, was the first book I did. With, by myself was called Tourist Season, and it was about at the center of the book was sort of with the antihero uh, was a uh, was Miami newspaper columnist who who just goes around the bend completely, and he goes a little bit crazy, and he puts together this motley group of of echo terrorists who are kind of inept, but <clears throat> their mission is that if they start con if they start kidnapping tourists, it'll start scaring people away from Florida, which is every Floridian's, you know, secret dream is, is a, a mass <laughs> exodus going the other way. So that was my fantasy too. And I, but I, I, it's funny. I had been on the investigative team at the Herald for a number of years. And, um, and uh, I, I, I was, I want to take a break for a couple, just a couple of months. I, I, Cause I want to start working on this novel. And they said, Sure. And I didn't tell him what it was about. I didn't tell him what the novel was about or anything. I was just working on it. And I got a call from the executive editor. He said, hey, remember when you first applied for a job here at the paper all those years ago? You said you wanted to, to write a column. And I said, yeah. He goes, well, how would you like to start a, a column on the city page? And I said, absolutely. He said, but I have to warn you something. I've just written a book about a deranged columnist. His name was Skip Wiley, and, and he works for Miami Paper, and he completely loses it and goes off the deep end. And, and, and the, I remember the editor sort of laughing. I mean, I'm sure he probably didn't think it was going to get published or wouldn't be anything, but it was in a weird way that I, I, I didn't model the character on me. The, the, I ended up more like not modeling myself after the character, but the character came before the character of the columnists came before I did. But it was certainly the things that that character said and did were things that I always wished I could have gotten away with saying and doing. <laughs> but it was just ironic that that's what it was about. I didn't, hadn't told anybody that that was what the book was about. And here, the, now they've offered me the column, which I've wanted all these years. So I said, all right, I'm just warning you when the book comes out, somebody's going to say, uh oh. That's the guy. <laughs> he wasn't kidding. Um, so that's probably the, I would guess the most, the most autobiographical, um, of, of them in that sense. Although I've never done any of the things that were done in the book. That's not to say I didn't wish I could have done them.
One of the things I always took pride in was balancing my writing career with the other things that I was working on. How did you manage the demands of both your city desk job with the newspaper and your career as a novelist? Uh, it, it wasn't easy when I was working on the newsroom and on the investigation team. I literally would get home at night and uh, a lot of times my son uh, would already be in bed. I wouldn't get to see him. And then I, you know, I'd sit up, watch a little TV with my wife, and then I would go in into an office and work. I mean, so I was all day at the paper. Then I'd work an hour or so every night on the book I was doing. And then once I started the column and I had a uh, my schedule was um, a little di- I had a little more flexibility. And eventually I moved. But they didn't care really. Once you sort of had the ability to file a column online, they didn't really care where you were. Um, so I moved. I had moved down to the Keys, and um, and I could I could plan my week. I had I had I was doing I started doing three a week columns, but that was a lot. And then and then they brought a third columnist, and so then I was doing two a week. And so I had some time, more time to work on the novels. Then you see, I mean. It just it, it worked out that way, and it would have worked out that way in the newsroom as well. Once once they were trying to uh, expand the number of, of city desk columnists they had, and uh, so and then eventually, the last few years, I was really I was just doing one. I was doing a Sunday column. That was all, and uh, I say that was all. It was you know it's still you know it's still supposed to be seven hundred and fifty captivating words, but uh, but that left me you know, quite a bit of time during the week. And, uh, you know, that's, that's where most of, you know, my effort was going at that point into the novels, but in the beginning, it was just crazy. And I'm sure at, at, uh, at the expense of my family, you know, you, you have a chance and someone offers you a book contract, but you've got a full-time newspaper job, but, but it's so hard to get a, an offer for a book contract back then that you just, you just suck it up and you, I'm going to, I'm going to, and I, here's my deadline. And I'm, I'm going to get it done and we'll see what happens. Um, and I, again, I was I just, everything turned out well, but I wasn't, it was, I look back on it. I couldn't do it now. I, I, I wouldn't have the uh, energy to do that now. It, it, I just, it was insane because I was commuting too. So, you know, it wasn't like I, I drove home 15 minutes. I was home when I was working. I was, it was over, you know, it was an hour and 15, hour and a half. The way I drove might be closer to an hour and 15, but. You know, it was just, it was insanity. What was the book where the balance tipped and you knew you could write books for a living and the newspaper was strictly for fun? That's, that is a great question. I think, I want to say, I think the first, the first of the novels I did that made the, the New York Times, um, bestseller list in hardback was, uh, I think the novel called Strip Tease that was eventually made into a movie. Um, but I think that, I mean, that, I mean, I remember I was on a book tour and I was, I was in Toronto and I just checked in the hotel. There was a message to call a publisher. I called and he said, Hey, the books, whatever. It was like number seven on the times list. And I was like, really? Cause you know, being Norwegian, you, you, there's no sense of op, there's no optimism. There's no, sunny side to that it's whatever you just think the, you think the worst all the time so i wasn't i didn't have my hopes up and so i thought it got on the list it stayed on the list for a few weeks and they went in you know they start pr- printing more copies and then and then uh like you know a, a producer and director in hollywood come they wanted to make a movie and all that happened pretty quick but at that point i realized i you know and it actually was liberating because uh, I was I was doing the column, and 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 the column really was from the heart, and I, and I didn't really have to. I knew that they I, they couldn't push me very far on that if they wanted to keep the column because I I didn't I didn't need the, the Miami Herald paycheck anymore. I want it to be there. And that gives you a great deal of leverage when you just want to be there and people want you to be there. And they, what are they going to threaten you with firing? Okay. Uh, no, that, and, 
And so if there was ever arguments about the column, and there weren't many, they were really good about, okay, that's just tie us and let him do it. But when there were issues that came up like, no, this is going too far, we can't do this, and there were meetings, I, I, I usually came out on the, on the top side of that because, I mean, honestly, I, and I mean, I argued soundly, I thought, not emotionally, but this is, you know, this is important. This is, you know, there were, I, I always got a, a fair hearing, I think, because, um, the column was popular and, and, uh, and I didn't need to be there, you know, so I think, um, Again, I, I mean, it, it was liberating in the sense that I, I could, I could throw myself into it, not worrying if I was going to get a call from the manager, editor, the executive editor. Yeah, you know, does that make any sense? I mean, it was just like, and and the truth is that most <laughs> most of the editors wanted to leave me alone. <laughs> they they didn't want their finger. If they knew if there's going to be a problem, it would be better if they weren't involved. It was just, oh, I didn't read it. Did you read it? Who read that? <laughs> you know, I, I had I had some good people. I had some great editors that sort of ran interference for me, too. How did you first meet Jimmy Buffett? And did you guys bond over your love of fishing right away? Oh, I met Jimmy. Um, my recollection is, is he called me from L.A. Uh, he wanted to option tourist season, I believe. And uh, it had already been optioned for the Hollywood. And uh, I think we might have met here and there earlier. And then uh, then you know, we certainly bonded over fishing, but I think we bonded more over um, just the the Florida connection and the, the Florida being so so much a part of each of our work, his music certainly at the time, and and. Uh, and all my novels. And so, yeah, we, we just hit it off and, you know, we, we went, we would go to heat, the heat basketball games when they weren't very good. And they were in the old arena. He, he always liked to go to the games even back then. And, uh, and then fishing trips and hanging out. And then he surprised me one time. He said, can you come, come down to Key West, to come down to the studio as the shrimp boat studios right on the wharf in Key West. And, he said, sure, I got something I want to hear. I'm working on an album. I want you to hear something. So I went down there and in the studio and they just slipped the suit. And it was a song. They weren't finished recording it. He wanted, they needed some people talking and doing clinking glasses together, something. But it was a song about, it's called The Ballad of Skip Wiley. And it was about the main character of Tourist Season. And uh, it, the whole song was about that character. And it just blew me away and it was funny. And, and he, I forget what I did on, on one of the, you know, we we're in a studio and I forget what he had us all. I wasn't singing. I promise you, he didn't, he knew better than write me his thing, but it was still, it was so, it was so cool, you know, and it was on an album that came out called Barometer Soup, that album. But I, I mean, I was, I was, I was blown away, but he was, a, he was a voracious reader and in you know, all kinds of, he was, he was close friends with a lot of writers, um, uh, and, uh, and, and I found that I've been able, uh, Jimmy was a, a dear friend and, uh, it was hard, uh, you know, you know, when he passed away, but he, he, he was extraordinarily productive and tough and, and, uh, and funny. And, but I found that over the years, this has been one of the side things, musicians, especially the musicians who are on the road a lot have a lot of time to read. So I, I've been so lucky I've gotten to meet because they were fans of the books. Uh, I've gotten to meet a lot of cool, you know, like childhood idols. Uh, you know, my, uh, one of my dear friends was Warren Zevon, who I, I, I had all his albums and everything else. And he's, he was a huge reader and he showed up at a book signing in LA and we became very good friends. And we did a couple of songs together. I mean, I, contributed lyrics let me say that not the music and then and i've gotten to meet so many you know david crosby and roger mcguinn and and um and jackson brown and i mean these were all writing heroes of mine because i always love their music and and the idea that i'm sitting there talking to them backstage because they they read the the books and like the books you know it's, it was pretty 
it was pretty amazing. And I got invited to a Rolling Stones concert one time because uh, they said, Woody and Keith want to meet you. Can't it, you know, Keith Richard? <laughs> and, you know, so I, they took me back to this little room where behind at the concert, they had a little snooker room. They always make up for these guys. They play snooker until they go on stage. <laughs> this is back when they're both smoking cigarettes. And, hey, dude, hey, mate, how you doing? So I'm talking. I'm sitting here. It's kind of surreal. I'm sitting here talking. And then I go out and they said, oh, Mick wants to say hi. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, sure. I'll say hi to Mick. What the? You know, what am I doing here? I was, it was so surreal, but it was cool because I think they just have a, a lot of time on their hands when they're on the road and they read, they, they read. And I had no idea, but it was, I mean, it's pretty cool, you know? Um, and, and, and I always, uh, I would talk to, with Timmy and I would talk about it. And of course he wrote books. It was very successful too. And, and, but we talk about how interesting it was if you're a musician and you, and you do a song that everybody likes, people might listen to that song a hundred times in their life. Or, or in my case, you know, or an old stones. How many times you listen to these songs? But you read a really good book. You might read it twice, maybe three times, but you don't, you don't read it every time you get in the car and press the button to hear it. You know what I mean? It's a whole different, the, the book is such a whole a, a different creature than a song is. And a song can be played a million times. A book, you know, over and over again gets old, <laughs> especially if you've written it yourself. Not long after that, you wrote your first middle grade novel, which was one of the hundreds of books that I read to my kids growing up. And I have got to tell you, not only did my kids love it, but it was also one of my personal favorites. This was your Newbery Medal winner, Hoot, which was also made into a movie. You had to have fun with your good friend Jimmy Buffett starring in the movie and providing the soundtrack, right? You also added a serious element to the book, bringing up the environmental impacts of humans. Uh, do all of your books take up for some type of a cause? Um, I, you know, Tim, I don't think of it as a cause because I always think of it as this. It's very close to what's going on in my own consciousness, the stories uh, that motivate me but hoot in particular um they had asked me to try writing a book for young readers and i thought they were nuts you know i, I said to the editor have you, have you not read any of the books i've written for grown-ups why would you want <laughs> why would you risk having me write for young readers? they said because kids enjoy the humor they like sarcasm they like a smart ass character they like all that so i, I didn't know how to start that. So I took this page from my own childhood about these little burrowing owls that lived right near where we grew up. And, um, and they're the cutest little things there in, in these burrows in, in, in pasture land and, and undeveloped property. I mean, and I, you pass them every day. We'd see them and you'd, you'd see them out sitting on the little burrows and everything. And then, but a developer came in uh, and my friends, uh, we saw all these survey stakes started appearing right out all where all the owls were. So my buddies and I, in an act of futility, gallant futility. So we, you know, we were kids. We, we did, we didn't know anything. You don't know what meeting to go to. You don't know what politicians are. Right. You just know something bad's going to happen. So we went out and we moved all the survey stakes around for a while and, you know, uh, messed them up a little bit and slowed them down. But eventually they built this thing and they, they buried these owls. They just bulldozed everything. So, my idea was to write about that, write that story, but put a different ending on it. You know, an ending that I would have wished, you know, would have happened in real life. So it was kind of selfish, but you, I wanted to tell the same story and how important it was. And at the same time, have an ending that I could, that the kids would like and could sort of rally to. It wasn't really meant to be any kind of a crusade or any kind of a cause. It was just something that really happened to me and it affected me and my, my buddies when we were young, because I, I talk, I've said this before, you know, this firsthand, Tim, the, the, if everybody had the clarity of, of kids, when it came to what's right and what's wrong, this world would be in a much better place. If everyone 
was able to sustain that clarity that you have when you're a kid, when you see something and you know just something is so wrong, how can it happen? And you grow up and not to let it happen or don't ever participate in it happening, the world will be a hell of a lot better place. But at some point it gets uh, people forget or it gets, you know, schooled out of them and, and when, when they get their MBAs or something. Um, but I wanted to keep that alive and, and I thought it was a good story and I knew the story. So, um, and it was fun. It, and it changed me because <clears throat> I still get hundreds of letters a year from about that book. And I, being as cynical as I am, um, uh, and you read these letters from these kids and how heartfelt they are. And they're not just from Florida, they're from all over the place. And you read how much they care about the planet and about what their place in and what we're doing and, and, and how thoughtful they are. And, and it's amazing. I was at an event in Jacksonville uh, last year and a woman and her husband came up to me and she was a, um, not, he was a field biologist and she was, uh, Another, she was some sort of environmental scientist, you know, and they're, uh, I would say in their late twenties, you know, and, and they both came up and said, we want you to know that we're both where we are because of that book. Who, when I read that book, when I was a kid, I decided I was going to be an environmental scientist hmm. and, and her husband too, blew me away. That's the last thing you think about when you write something, at least me. But they were they were totally sincere, and they had copies of the book they wanted me to sign for them, and and so that's that's one person, right? But it still it it, it still keeps you going, you know. If, if you're a writer and you hear that, man, it, 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 you don't think about it. I it having that kind of an impact, especially coming from the newspaper business where. As the joke is, whatever you write today is in the bottom of the birdcage tomorrow. You know, there's really no longevity to it at all. But to have the one thing about novels is that they do stay on the shelves and generations have, you know, read them and, 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 and who is still taught in, in, in lots of, lots of schools. And so, you know, you keep writing because, you know, that, that's a rare thing. You know, to have to have that come of something you wrote, I think. One of your first novels, Striptease, ended up being made into a movie starring Demi Moore and Burt Reynolds. That must have been a thrill. Or was it painful to see what Hollywood did to your story? It wasn't painful. I, I was aware, you know, I, I'd had um, some, some experience with Hollywood where the options had been you know, ex, you know, the other books have been optioned out. I, I'd have, I'd have several scripts done on other books. So I, I knew what the process was. I knew what the odds were. And I had enough friends in the business that I knew that, that they almost always have to change the novel, um, for structural reasons, for other things. It's, it's very rare to have a book that follows the novel exactly. Um, and I had Andy Bergman, who, who directed it, and wrote it, had, had done some movies that I thought were hilarious and funny and sharp. So I had I did have high expectations. And then um, and I, I they were everyone was so nice to me. And I was on the set only a couple of days. I didn't make a pest of myself. But I uh, but I knew, you know, I got an inkling that because friends had said told me Warren that it. You know, towards the end of production, I get a call just from Andy or somebody said, yeah, I think we're going to have to reshoot the ending, whatever the ending they had put on it. And I knew whenever you hear reshoot the ending, it's sort of like, all right, well, and they, they kind of, uh, I mean, they, uh, you know, I mean, uh, but I wasn't, I have to say, I, I, I can't say I had. I just knew the process, so I wasn't crushed or anything. I mean, and I thought there were some good scenes, and there were some scenes they shot that didn't make the movie that were hilarious. Um, but I'll, I don't know whether it was Faulkner, maybe it was Hemingway, one of those guys, or maybe it was Fitzgerald who said, all you can do is, you know, walk up to the, the, the California state line, and you throw them the manuscript, and they throw you a bag of money, and you just walk away. I mean, if you're going to get emotionally invested and you're going to – going to be crushed by the experience, then don't put yourself in. And, and I have been pretty judicious about doing that. I mean, I, I had, I mean, 
said no more than I've said yes to, okay, you can see what you can do with the script or something. And I still have boxes and boxes of scripts that, that weren't made. And some of them were pretty good. And some of them I'm, I'm grateful they, they weren't made, but it was fun. Bert, Bert Reynolds, you know, he was, he was a Florida guy. So I put on a set with him to me was as nice as she could possibly be to me. It was, um, uh, it was everybody, the director, everybody was just super nice. And, I didn't have any complaints. Look at, uh, you know, if the worst, I said, I said to people, I said, if the worst thing that happens in your life is that someone makes a movie of one of your books and it doesn't turn out exactly like the book, then you still had a pretty good life. You know, if that's the worst thing, if that's all you can bitch about, you're, you're okay. I'm sorry, but I have to ask you about your brother, Rob. He was killed in the deadliest mass shooting in the state of Maryland by a psychopath who was the embodiment of evil. Rob was a journalist as well, and the perpetrator was disgruntled about the newspaper's accurate reporting of his conviction for harassment. How did your brother's death affect you? Did it lead to a crisis of faith? Or maybe you had no faith to lose? The reason I'm asking is because I had my own crisis of faith when I was diagnosed with ALS. It doesn't take much imagination to figure how I could ask, why me? Anyway, what happened when I was wallowing in self-pity was God spoke to me, not aloud, but in my mind. And I knew then that I could kill myself or embrace the challenge, grow in my faith. And when people see me and say, that guy's indomitable, where does he get the strength? And I have the opportunity to say, it's not me. Any strength, any success to God goes the glory. Well, I mean, after yeah, Rob was killed, there was, you know, I mean, there was the, uh, I mean, the first shock of seeing it all play out on, on CNN and Fox and, uh, and not having official word, but at not hearing from him and no one can, no one can reach him and, and then having all, you know, papers and people calling me for, for, for comment. And, uh, before, you know, you're just on the edge of your seat praying, you know, um, but it, the irony too, is that for, in my column for, for all, all those years, many years, I, I wrote about gun violence and I wrote about, uh, the insane lenience of, of guns laws and, and, and the corruption of the NRA of politicians and the whole political force that behind the NRA, which is really gun manufacturers, not gun owners. And, and so I'd written and written and written about this and then to have it uh, hit home in the way that it did, um, you know, there's a numb, I think there's a numbness to it. Uh, uh, Cause you know, in, in your case, it was something that was happening to you and, 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 in my case, it was a family, you know, the, it's the shattering of, of a fan, of a family and, and becoming part of this growing tragic community of, of people who have lost loved ones in mass shootings. I mean, it's just become a, a big community, unfortunately. So I, I mean, I, my, the, the way I reacted was not, not through faith so much because I, 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 uh, I never had that much faith, but I, I didn't, I wasn't able to write for a couple of months, which had never happened to me since, in, well, in my whole life of writing, I really couldn't write. And, um, and I wondered if I was able to again. And what got me through it was my brother, memories of my brother and the talks we would have about writing and about, I mean, he, he was an editor at the Capital Gazette newspaper, but he was also a columnist too. And the, the, we, we'd had talks about just the hard work and the, you just do it on days you feel terrible. You've got to write. There's no writer's block. You've got to do it. You've got to do it. And I thought how, um, uh, I don't want to use the word disappointed, but uh, how unhappy he would be to think that, um, uh, that, that, that I had just thrown in the towel or quit or given up out of grief for him. You know what I mean? I just, I always had him in the back of my mind sort of looking 
over my shoulder saying, why haven't you written anything yet? Why, why haven't, why, why aren't you doing anything? And so I finally decided to write a column for the paper about it with him in my ear in a way. And, uh, then I was able, from that point on, I was able to kind of start up again, but I, there were a couple months. I, I, I have to say that I just, uh, the, yeah, and it's still to this day is hard. It, it's hard. And, and, you know, I wish people could understand that when, when these things happen and if it's, whether it's five or six or 10 or however many people are, 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 are injured or wounded by these maniacs, that the ripple effect that it has on families and friends and loved ones goes on and on and it never stops and it never goes away. Even, even though the, the, the guy who shot Rob is going to be in jail the rest of his life. Um, I, I don't, I, the, the concept of, of closure really isn't, isn't there. I mean, because nothing's going to bring the, bring him back, you know, my brother, but, I mean, I guess if they never caught the guy or if he got off scot free, then you would have the whatever the opposite, the pain of not having that closure. But in terms of what happened, because since then I couldn't, I used to keep track of how many mass shootings were going on. This, this happened in, in uh, June of, of 2018. So it's been six years and I lost count. Uh, and, and it's still, hard to uh, when it happens the, the whole family gets affected if it's another you know if there's another it's cnn breaking news cuts in and it's another scene and it's another chaotic mass shooting it that it, it just it never it, it's never going to stop not in, not in this country so i guess i get my strength from thinking about him and how much he loved writing and how much he loved journalism and that he was just uh doing his job in the newsroom that day when this happened. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think, you know, I just, I, I would want him to be uh, glad that I was still writing. I guess that's the best way to put it. This is one of my favorite questions to ask. Uh, Carl, would you like to tell us about your family? Feel free to brag about your kids. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, I think they probably have enough of a burden <laughs> already. Um, my, you know, my, my youngest was a journalist, a terrific journalist for many years and then, uh, went to law school at night and now he's an attorney in Miami and, and my, both my dad and my granddad on that side were attorneys and they would be very, very proud. And my other son lives in, in Bozeman and, um, Montana and, uh, you know, I've been, again, fortunate on all of that. I try to stay in touch with Rob's family as, mu as much as I can. And, uh, um, but, you know, uh, and this isn't an excuse, but writers, we spend so much time, you know, in a room with four walls. I mean, you're, you're, you spend your whole day. If you're writing, on a, if you're working on a book, you're really isolated most of the day. You're self-isolated and you're, you're caught up in this world and, 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 You've got this whole other family in your head, and that's the cast of characters you've created for the book. So you can have quiet on, on one side of your family, but what's going on in your brain can be a chaos because, you know, I always, when I'm writing, I typically lose control of the, the characters in the novels. By chapter five, they've run off and they're totally, I can't, I can't handle them anymore. And so I'm always kind of uh, preoccupied, and I, I, I know that's not fair to uh, your loved ones all the time that, you know, that you're walking around grumbling about in your head about what's going on. But um, there are worse ways uh, to make a living. You know, I mean, it, uh, and, and I feel like if you're, if you're blessed enough to be able to do this and, and have wonderful fans and readers who enjoy it, that you just have to stay at it. And, you know, that, you know, you just keep plugging away. I mean, what I hold was Elmore Leonard when he passed away. And I mean, he, uh, it, you know, he was in his eighties. My friend Jim Harrison um, was in the middle of a sentence. He wrote longhand. I don't know how he was able to do it, but he wrote longhand. He was just in the middle of a sentence when it all ended. And that's, that's what, that's what you hope for. You know, I, I mean, I, 
uh, you just, I don't think there's an off switch to it. And, uh, and as long as I can, I, I'll do it, you know, and, uh, um, I guess, but I mean, of course you'll reach a point where someone will just say, you know, put their arm around you. Okay. He thinks he's still writing. They'll just pat me on. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure that's so that my wife will just say, just let him think he's still doing something. <laughs> he's staying out of trouble at least. Carl, I didn't want to end this podcast without thanking you for two favors you did for me years ago. First, you gave me a quote for one of my books, which was awesome and a badge of honor for me. Second, you sent your wife and son to a book signing of mine in South Florida. And I never fully appreciated that until I heard you and John Grisham doing an interview together and talking about how every author goes through the experience of doing a book signing and having no one show up. And then it struck me that you sent them to ensure that I didn't get shut out in your hometown. <laughs> I, um, well, my son is a fan, so it, I didn't have to twist his arm very much. It was it was a, a celebrity sighting for for him. So, uh, but I, I I appreciate that, and I it's a, the book the book tours are uh, they can be very humbling, as you know, and uh, uh, everybody goes through it, and it's not you complain, but it makes you appreciate. It makes you appreciate it uh, much more. I mean, that's the only fun part of a book tour is meeting your readers. You know, it, I don't mean to be mean to, about the media and things, but the best part is meeting the people who are actually reading your book and talking to them and having the kids, you know, in line and they're waiting. It's just, it's the best. And uh, um, the travel and the rest of it. Eh. But uh, I, I do like that part of it. Now on to our final word segment where we ask our guests a few rapid fire questions. What was the happiest moment in your life? Uh, I, well, probably uh, meeting my wife. What is the biggest adversity you faced? I, I think the, the death of my own father, which was very sudden and he was young. And uh, I just, I just started my career and he he didn't get to, to see a lot of this happen to me so that that, that would probably it's a first i mean that was a tough one what are you most excited about i'm i'm most excited about uh typing two words at the end of the manuscript i've been struggling with the end i'm most excited about that the name of our podcast is nothing left unsaid do you have anything you want to say I want to say thank you, and and it's been an honor. And and Tim, thank you for thinking of me and having me on. And Troy, it's been a great experience. And uh, I hope I didn't rattle on too long, but um, it's uh, there's a, a a community of writers who who know how hard it is and how rewarding it is, and and how lucky we should all feel to have. Uh, readers who care about our stuff. And I know, I know Tim is one of those. So thank All I can say is thanks for having me. No, yeah, you were great. It was great having you. The last, this is the last question. I'm going to let you off the hook. On, at the end of every episode, I always ask the guest. Um, one thing that was important to us is we wanted to talk to a lot of different people. We didn't want it to be just, you know, about football or just writing or just ALS. So we always ask the guests, anybody, you know, who are a couple of people that, uh, you think we should have on the podcast to tell their story? Oh, uh, boy, that's good. N not a writer. It could be anybody. It could be a writer. It could be from any, anything. Uh, you know, as uh, sadly, most of my, my friends are in that trade. Um, they're writers fine too. It doesn't have to not be a writer. I, we wanted our podcast to not be only writers or only football players, yeah. but for you, Whatever yeah, you think I, be good. I think I live in such a a, a, a sheltered world. It, it doesn't have to be someone that I know. Yeah, someone you know. Oh, someone I know. See, that even narrows it down. I, I, I'm not that. <laughs> I'm not that social. Um, boy, God, that's that's a good one. I mean, I know writers. I don't. Um, well, as a combination, Mike Lupica, who was a great sports writer for years and years and now, now writes novels with Jim Patterson and wrote a, a very popular series of uh, 
uh, uh, b- books uh, for for kids who are athlete sort of athletically themed. He would he would be good because he could talk about both, and he would talk about both. And you you're going to have to get one of those mute buttons that they had for the Trump debate, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Uh, but Lupica is a friend. Um, uh, I'm, I, my, my hobby, my own secret, not secret, my only really true hobby is, uh, fishing, fly fishing. So, um, I always uh, enjoy hearing and talking with, uh, Tom McGuane, who was a tremendous novelist, but also a fabulous fly fisherman and one of the great storytellers, especially about, the old Key West days and Jimmy Buffett and the gang that was down there in the seventies, which is all the, the statutes of limitations have expired on everything he'll tell you. So it'll, it'll be good. Um, th- those would be two suggestions. Um, those are awesome. yeah. And, uh, trying to think, I don't, I don't really know, uh, any, I mean, uh, the people I would like to see on it, people that, you know, probably, you know, it would be interesting, like, but I don't know. I don't know them. They're musicians. I would love to hear from, but I, I don't know them to call them or anything, you know, I mean, uh, um, but, you know, it's about all I can think of who aren't, who, who aren't writers. Um, uh, trying to think of, oh, you know, who'd be great if you could get him on. Um, uh, who, who's terrific on this stuff. And he's also knows about everything. He's not only a fanatical, uh, sports fan, but, but, uh, fisherman. And, and, uh, if you could ever get him on, it's Michael Keaton. He's a friend of mine and he is t- tremendous on things. He's funny as hell, but he's so smart. And, and, and he, 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 ta- he can talk about writing, directing, acting, fishing. You know, he's just very entertaining on here. Awesome. Thanks so much for the recommendations. And thanks for joining us today. It was great. Carl Hyacin, it has been a great pleasure to get together with you. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, man. Uh, Again, an honor for me. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barclay Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to barclaydamon.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Nurse Corps, the heart of healthcare. This is the home healthcare company that I personally use. I also wanted to give a special thanks to all my amazing nurses. For more information, go to nursecore.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast, Nurse Corps for their truly amazing team, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to tackleals.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to tackleals.com.